Good morning, friends at Glendale. I was so excited about joining you for in-person worship on May 22nd. Alas, it is not to be. Thank you for letting me walk along with you through technology with a big shout out to Katie Neeson Cook for her flexibility. I remember a number of months ago watching TV journalist Chris Cuomo broadcasting when he was recovering from COVID. I remember thinking he looks a bit ragged around the edges. I am grateful I can connect with you today, even if I am feeling a bit ragged myself. Will you listen with me for this reading of the gospel? The gospel of John chapter five, verses one through nine. Hear the reading of God's word. After this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethsatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. Here ends this reading of God's word for us. <clears throat> Our gospel reading is a moving testimony to Jesus' desire that we all be well. He singles out a man who has just about given up on feeling able, feeling able to have a full life. Those gathered at the pool do so in hopes that when an angel stirs the water, they can hop in and be healed. Jesus appears to take in the man's dilemma that others push and crowd in front of him when the waters are active. Jesus wastes no time in offering healing, even though the man in our story has not asked for it. Many commentators have noted that when Jesus asks, do you want to be made well? The man whose sickness is not specified doesn't even say yes. He can only focus on his failed efforts to get into the water. He needs Jesus to hear his frustration and his fear. And once heard, the man then finds the courage to stand up at Jesus' invitation. Earlier this week, my husband and I were away at a conference when we received a call that his brother had died of aggressive brain cancer. We found ourselves needing to notify family from afar in a hotel walkway that offered good phone reception, but little privacy. We were so focused on our to-do list of calls that we weren't really conscious of being in a public space where anyone could overhear. After a while on the phone, a gentleman we had not even noticed came over, extended his hand to my husband and offered his condolences. I am so sorry about your brother, man. I didn't mean to eavesdrop or intrude. I would have stepped away earlier had I realized what you were dealing with. This man's kind gesture, unasked for when we were so preoccupied, touched us both. It made us feel whole, even in our grief. This is what Jesus does for the man at the pool. He offers wholeness. Now I have to confess here my lover's quarrel with many interpretations of this story. Traditionally, I've heard sermons, and you probably have too, about how Jesus wakes us up out of our passivity, our preoccupation with barriers to see a new way forward. I both agree with this approach 
and yet I have problems making the story about the passivity of the sick man. It feels too much like blaming the victim. Of course this man is stuck, having tried and failed for decades to find a way forward. I love that Jesus cuts to the chase without shaming the sick man. Jesus simply wants him to feel able, to feel whole. There's a subtle surprise in these passages, which it's easy to miss. Feeling the power of a lame man who can suddenly pick up his mat and walk, we might not notice the very end of verse nine, which says, now that day was a Sabbath. Here, I wanna acknowledge the insights of my dear seminary classmate, per Carrie Pidcock Lester, whose words I am borrowing from heavily this morning. In reflecting about this instance of Jesus healing on the Sabbath, Carrie wonders, why does Jesus heal the crippled man on this day of all days? The man had been afflicted for 38 years. What more would one day matter? Carrie imagines Jesus slipping over to the man's mat, leaning over and whispering, meet me here tomorrow morning and I'll help you. Because as we know, healing on the Sabbath gets Jesus into a whole big pickle with the religious authorities. Healing on the Sabbath lands him into conflict that eventually leads to execution. John Calvin, our ancestor in the faith, responds to this story by saying, why would Jesus wait to heal? It was a festival time, they were in Jerusalem, it was a holy day, what better time to, in his words, declare God's glory among the nations and tell of God's wondrous deeds? Except, as my friend Carrie notes, if good publicity is Jesus's aim, why does he slip away quietly afterwards into the festival crowd? I agree with her that when it comes right down to it, Jesus responds to suffering in the moment, not so much to make a statement, but because it is God's very nature to want to make us whole. It's God's nature not to look away or delay. God in Jesus cannot not heal in the face of sickness, regardless of the circumstances. Carrie notes, Jesus works in a world that does not always want to see displays of God's power, especially if this power trumps its own power. When the authorities ask Jesus to explain himself, the proverbial water in the pot begins to heat up. He speaks of obedience to his Father's will and work. In essence, Jesus says, God is always about giving life, even on the Sabbath. Rabbis note that babies are born on the Sabbath. Rain continues to fall, as in the storms around me right now, on the Sabbath. As Carrie puts it, life and love flow from God's heart at all times and in all places to all people. So they flow from Jesus' obedient hands towards a Samaritan woman, a royal official, a nameless lame man, close quotes. In the end, this story is as much about who Jesus is than what he does. He and the Father are one. As we read on in the text, in Carrie's words, it is clear that the world cannot restrain Jesus from saving us any more than it can hold back the tide. The U.S. death toll from COVID-19, as we know, hit one million this week. One newspaper article notes that the confirmed number of dead is roughly equal to how many Americans died in the Civil War, War and World War II combined. You know, I think experiencing a pandemic is probably the closest thing to war that many of us have known. 
and we are tired. We are afraid. We feel overwhelmed at what seems like the inevitability that we will all eventually become infected despite the most careful distancing, masking, vaccinations, and boosters. While some of us are merely inconvenienced by COVID, many others' lives are changed forever. Loved ones are no longer among us. We despair at when, oh, when life will ever return to normal. And then we see images of what is happening to the Ukrainian people. We recoil in horror when a gunman invites witnesses to his race-based murder plan. Right now, the world feels much like those five porticos at the Sheep Gate, lined with people who are decidedly not feeling whole. What word does Jesus bring us on this day as individuals, as nations, as a church? He brings us reassurance that we are seen, that God hears our cries, that healing is always ahead for us, even if we don't know how to ask for it. Jesus brings us assurance that God makes a way out of no way, that God imagines possibilities we are not yet capable of seeing. And Jesus brings us reassurance that even when the powers of this world, the greed and evil and brokenness seem to prevail, even death as a criminal cannot stop the healing work of a God who wants wholeness for all people in all times and in all places. Some of you may have seen on social media a powerful set of images by artist Kia Ora, which appeared around the time of Holy Week. It really um, struck me. These images depict a kneeling Jesus washing the feet of people in need of healing, whether they recognize it or not. Receiving Jesus' tender care are folks who appear to be living on the street, anti-vaxxers, a healthcare worker, a child, an LGBTQ individual holding a rainbow flag, a man struggling with addiction, another living as a person of color. There's a laughing nun, there is the Pope, there is Joe Biden, and there is Donald Trump. God wants wholeness for all people in all times and in all places. I know of no more glorious vision of God's shalom than our passage from the book of Revelation describing the realm of God. The new Jerusalem is a place where we need no sun or moon because God's glory is our light. We dwell by a river which nourishes trees, trees whose leaves provide healing for all the nations. There we are known by name and we are whole, able to cast aside our mats and walk freely in the light and love of a gracious God. Friends, Jesus invites us to trust that these promises are ours. Will you pray with me? God of possibilities, we pray this day for all your children waiting to be healed. We pray for our siblings in Buffalo who are grieving losses fueled by fear. Fear that others will rush into the healing pool ahead of us. We pray for our Taiwanese Presbyterian sisters and brothers whose community has been rocked by senseless violence. We pray for the people of Ukraine and for people everywhere living in the midst of violence and oppression. We pray for this congregation in its time of transition and for your church in the midst of seismic change. Help us to trust that you hear us, O oh God, you seek us out, 
You know our needs even before we ask. You offer us healing beyond our imaginations. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, your Son, our saving Lord. Amen.